20 years ago, um, I was a young climate activist. I had to give that title up about 10 years ago. Um, and so in coming here to speak with you today, I had a bit of a think about what I wish people had told me back then. Or on reflection, I have to admit probably what I wish I'd listened to back then too. One of the things that I guess I wish I'd uh, known, that I guess people, I wish that people had kept on saying to me was don't give up. So back in, uh, let's just go back 20 years ago, um, I was one of a few people um, around the country organising rallies of young people, just like we do these days. Um, there were fewer of us then, uh, calling for action on what we then called global warming. I was 15 and I really did think that perhaps through this action maybe we'd be listened to. Um, I thought maybe Bob Hawke and Paul Keating might, you know, actually pay attention. And I was deeply disappointed that they didn't. And I think that did have an impact on how passionate I was in relation to this cause for quite a while. Um, and I did persist. Um, and I did come back to it and I'm glad that I did. The other thing that I wish that I'd known as an activist, um, mostly on climate change, but also I dipped in and out of other issues. Sometimes I thought climate change was too hard, so I spent a period of time working on child protection, which was much easier, <coughs> sadly. <laughs> um, you push yourself really hard because you know that you, you've watched the Greenland video. You know how much this matters. You push yourself that, that extra bit all the time. And I guess... <coughs> I've learnt the hard way that if you're not good to yourself, then you can't be useful. You're a vehicle for this change and you have to look after yourself so that you can be useful. I did stupid things like when I was Tony Burke's chief of staff, my PA would come and bring me you know, glasses of water or cups of tea or whatever it was and I'd look at my schedule and i think I don't have time for a toilet break. <laughs> Seriously, like that. <laughs> this week, um, a dream of mine came true. Um, had been waiting for it for, for a couple of decades, as I mentioned. The House of Representatives in Parliament finally passed a bill um, to, to give us a price on carbon. <laughs> and uh, I know that um, if I and the many thousands of others um, around the world and in Australia had given up on that dream, it wouldn't have happened. So, persist. There's still a long road to go yet, and we need you. The other thing I wish people had said to me was um, that I shouldn't underestimate myself. Um, I never dreamed I would hold the jobs that I've held. I never imagined that I would be good enough to do that. Um, it's always surprised me every time I've got one of them. Me? Really? Oh, cool. <laughs> Um, I've under underestimated the power of my combined passion and commitment and adequate intellect. And I've seen examples, and Tim spoke about uh, the people who walked the halls of Parliament House, some great minds, really, really impressive people, very uh, capable intellects. But without that passion and commitment, they're not up to it. And so I think um, the people in this room, by virtue of the fact that you are here, are showing that passion and commitment. And do not underestimate the power of that, because that's what drives you that little bit longer. That's what makes you think, hang on, we're looking at this problem in the wrong way. What else can we do? How else can we tackle this? And you will find those answers, because you are driven to find them in a way that others aren't. The other thing, uh, the piece of advice that I actually did get, um, I was first a Chief of Staff about 10 years, in, 10 years ago in South Australia to um, a minister who I'm actually very proud to be able to say will be um, the Premier of South Australia in a few days. Um, and when I took on that role, I had a chat to my mum. I said, you know, this is a great opportunity, but how, how am I not going to become one of those people who makes a whole lot of compromises that when I reflect on it, I'm not going to be able to live with myself? She didn't seem very worried, which I thought was a bit weird. Um, and she said, that's easy, it's just your motivation. Every time you're, you're thinking about what path to, date, to take, check on your motivation. Make sure that the reason that you're making any given decision is because that you are sure that that pathway will, is the best pathway to deliver better, happier, fairer lives 
for people. Now I, now I have to call it tonight and say, hey mum, do you know I talked to these people today and I shared that advice that you've given me and they clapped. <laughs> She'll like that. Thanks. <laughs> um, that advice has held me in very, very, very good stead and um, it's something that I've reflected on daily and the choices that I've made have always gone back. And the advice that I've given as a political staffer has often been that advice to my ministers. What choice are we making? Let's put aside everything else. Everything else is secondary. There, uh, there's an overlay of political decision making um, that needs to be put on top of that. But first and foremost, what's the outcome here? Always back to first principles. Uh, and then, you know, does, does this decision mean that my minister will still be able to be effective and useful or my organisation will still be able to do everything that it needs to do? So uh, that's the sort of perspective um, that I guess I bring to, to the work that I've been doing. I'd like to talk a little bit about the political environment now that we find ourselves in and perhaps why it is that our, our opponents have been um, somewhat successful politically, although not fortunately, in the, um, in the outcome in Parliament this week. Since Tampa in 2001, at that election that um, John Howard won again because he refused to uh, allow refugees or asylum seekers to come to shore in Australia and, and refused to, to, um, to let Australians see the faces of those people, he um, did not allow the media to show the faces of these people. They were all blocked out all blurry, um, so, and therefore not human. But what was he playing on there by doing that? He was playing to people's fear. And that's how every election since then has been won. Sadly, even the 2007 election, uh, which Labor won, was won on fear. It was won on a fear campaign around industrial relations. There were uh, two other issues in the 2007 election which were actually about hope and that was climate change and broadband, of all things, because they were about the future. And so, whilst people voted because they were frightened of the impact of industrial relations changes, they also voted because they had some sense that it was time to vote for the future. So, uh, how do we counter fear um, versus hope? So, at the moment, we've got um, a pretty successful campaign from our opponents which says that if we act on climate change it will increase the cost of living. Now we have all the evidence that says we don't really uh, uh, need to worry about that. People are better off than they have ever been. The rich are getting richer. What's the problem here? We know this. But it's been a successful campaign because it goes to that sense of security that people have or don't have. And in the context of a global financial crisis there's some anxiety and some nervousness. Now there's a whole other speech on that that I won't go to today. But we need to be aware of the environment in which we're playing and that it is an emotional one. And that unfortunately we have so much evidence on our side. And I say unfortunately because it's too complicated. And so as communicators we have to get much more effective and the government was awful at this, you know, terrible. It was pretty awful to watch. Um, and I'm sure you all, all shared that, but there are really compelling arguments as to why we need to act. We've heard them today, we hear them all the time, we actually know them ourselves really well and some of us can sprout off all those facts and figures, I can't. Um, but it doesn't help us when we're fighting on an emotional basis and that's why I feel so lucky to be talking with you today because the most important and powerful voice in this debate is young people, without a doubt. Do not underestimate that. You are more important than Get Up, than the Climate Institute, than the ACF. It's you who will make the difference because... <laughs> because it's you who are the future. And in this battle, it's the past against the future. Um, and in fact, our opponents have made a bit of an error in being represented by um, almost always, admittedly there are some young liberals there, but really everyone who's been protesting on this every time I've seen them about the place, and most recently in Parliament House this week, 
um, needed their walkers to be able to get in. And, <laughs> uh, and, um, and so you have a, you kind of have an advantage about on this front. <laughs> um, it's important to know what you're playing with too here. These people were, um, uh, now James, you mentioned Provost Club talks. You need to get out to the Bathurst Provost Club in particular. They were there on uh, Wednesday for the boat. Um, they all had their special signed in passes from an MP so that they could go into um, question time and shout that democracy was dead. That was an organised campaign. That's what we're up against, a really, you know, well facilitated and organised campaign. So we need to know who our opponents are. The other um, aspect of, of uh, who our opponents are is the media. There are campaigns being run you know, against balanced coverage on climate change and a bunch of things. Um, we're very much in an opinion cycle of provision of information, not, not one that is actually about information and facts. And so there are some alternatives that we can use. We can use social media, and we do. Um, we can use the media who actually are fairly balanced, and that's in generally everyone except for News Limited and, um, and 2GB. Um, and, we can, uh, and we can use community activity. Go back to how people used to campaign many, many eons ago, and that's in your local community. And so in terms of giving you some advice about what can be the, the most useful thing to do right now, Get active in your community. Uh, longer term, I would suggest learn to communicate on this issue effectively. Um, admit that you have heaps more information than most people and that uh, you probably can't translate all of that for them, so keep it simple. Uh, and get involved. Uh, if you've ever um, sat there watching the news thinking, how awful is this government? What are they doing? Go on. You have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Um, get involved. Get in there. Uh, learn what you need to, to learn about your opponents. So work in the media, work in government, work in corporates, gain that knowledge and use it to, uh, to fight this fight because it's going to be a long one yet, sadly. Uh, so in closing, I'd just say uh, it is up to you. You are the most important voice in this. Do not underestimate how important you are. Make sure you get yourselves on radio, on TV, communicate with your neighbours, write them letters, and uh, at the end of this, um, at the end of Power Shift, go and recruit 10 more people just like you, because that's what will win the day. Thank you. Woo!